Legacy is an aspect of superhero stories that isn't very common over at Marvel. While DC has had numerous titles that pass from one character to another, Marvel doesn't really do that. Many people have used the Captain America name, but it always comes back to Steve Rogers. Same with Thor, Peter Parker and Jessica Drew. Two exceptions to this are Ant-Man and Captain Marvel, both of which have featured in self-titled entries of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Neither one centres on the original hero to bear the titular mantle and both approach the legacy of those titles very differently. Ant-Man centres on second Ant-Man, Scott Lang. I have three theories as to why they opted for him over the original Ant-Man, Hank Pym. For one, Scott was Ant-Man at the time, while Hank had since moved on to the Yellow Jacket and later Wasp monikers. Second, Scott has a strong emotional hook, being an ex-con trying to do right by his ex-wife and their daughter. Hank's story would be more focused on his romance with Janet and his mental health, which leads us into our third reason. During a suspension from the Avengers, the mentally unstable Hank plotted to use a robot that would decimate the team, only for him to then defeat it and regain his glory and place on the team. Janet found out and Hank hit her when she tried to stop him. This one incident has become Hank's lasting legacy and eternal shame, even more so than the fact that he created Ultron. One needs only look at his toxic relationship with Janet in the Ultimate Universe to see how heavily this has followed him since. As a result of this, I'm sure no one at Disney or Marvel Studios was particularly keen to dive into the sea of articles about how Marvel's newest hero is a domestic abuser. I'm sure Hank could lead his own movie now after two moves about how he loves his wife very much and will go to any length to bring her back, but at the time? Yeah, Scott was probably the safer option. Speaking of Scott, uh, Scott from NerdSync once made a video to explain that Hank wasn't meant to actually strike Janet like that, so check that one out. The point of all this backstory is that opting for the second Ant-Man over the original was very much a necessity even if that wasn't the main reason they chose Scott. But despite them skipping over Hank, they made sure to properly pay tribute to the one who started it all. Hank is a prominent character in the Ant-Man films, retaining his role in the discovery and naming of Pym Particles, the creation of all the technology Scott employs, and even being the original Ant-Man in the past. But more than just playing a key part in both the creation of Ant-Man and Scott's assuming that mantle, the actual stories of the films revolve around Hank. He's the one who arranges for Scott to become Ant-Man and trains him to use the technology to its fullest. The other part of the series Trinity is Hank's daughter, and the villains of the first two films are motivated by their connections to Hank instead of Scott. Scott is the protagonist and the focus of the films on the micro level, but Hank is the one who connects all of the characters and serves as the focus on the macro level. I mean, there's a reason they opted for the first film's antagonist to use Hank's moniker from his unstable period. And more than that, they used a reimagining of Hank's daughter from the defunct MC2 imprint to create a narrative parallel between the two Ant-Men, both of whom love their families and are trying to redeem themselves and repair their damaged relationships with their respective wife and daughter. Through working together, both are able to mend their relationships and reunite their families, leaving both much more complete than they were before they met. Isn't that nice? All in all, the Ant-Man films not only acknowledge Hank's part in the legacy and the persona he created and make a great mental figure out of him, but they also pay tribute to him in pretty much every facet of the storyline and cleaned up his image enough that one can easily imagine him getting his own film now. Now, let's move over to Captain Marvel and see how well that film handles the legacy aspect. The Captain Marvel of the MCU is Carol Danvers. Originally a love interest for the original Captain, Marvel, Carol gained her own powers and became the spin off character, Ms. Marvel, before adopting the Captain moniker briefly in House of M, before taking it for real in 2012, making her the seventh character to officially use the name in the main Earth 616 continuity. I covered this in more detail on Cannonball if you want to know more. Why Carol was chosen likely comes down to her using the title in the comics at the time, her being the most popular character to use it, at least in Marvel, Billy would easily take that spot across all companies, and because it made for an easy win with the kinds of people that had been clamouring for a female-led movie in the MCU for years, even if they did let the chance to have the first good female-led superhero movie slip through their fingers and become one of the few wins DC's floundering cinematic universe ever had over the MCU. Of course, there are two other female Captain Marvels, but one comes with the baggage of being Marvel's daughter and not particularly popular, though she absolutely should be in a Guardians film with her her space dragon GF, while the other only used the name and isn't really connected to the legacy beyond that. Still, the latter does show up in the film along with Marvel, and I think we can all agree that neither one was really honoured the way Hank was. First, Marvel. In the comics, Marvel was a Kree military captain who turned against his people to protect the Earth. Sadly, he's mainly remembered for the acclaimed story in which he died, which I think could have been used in the climax or a sequel that passes the torch to Carol, but maybe they figured that a story about a woman who don't need no man works better if she doesn't take every tool at her disposal from a man, Kate. 
In the movie, Marvel is a female Kree scientist because hashtag more girls in STEM? The gender change may not have been to push the girl power message, like how I doubt the Ancient One's sex change in Doctor Strange was to serve that purpose, but given how the film presents Carol and falls into that trap, so many other female-led stories do, where the cast is predominantly female and the men are mostly incompetent, evil or just general douchebags, it's hard not to see it that way. At the very least, you'd think they'd have made her a warrior still, but that got changed as well. For my money, Jude Law should have played a warrior Marvel who forms a strong bond with Carol and passes the torch to her at the end. Think Vic and Renee in DC's 52. As for Monica Rambeau, here she's the child of Carol's old Air Force partner Maria, who looks up to her Aunt Carol. I'm surprised they made Monica the daughter instead of the actual partner, but with the film being set in the 90s, I assume the plan is for Monica to be an adult in Carol's next adventure and serve as her big screen successor, while Kamala Khan fills that role in the TV shows. Adult Monica's already confirmed for an appearance on the WandaVision show on Disney+. Plus. Until then, the closest thing to an acknowledgement of her place in the Captain Marvel legacy Monica got is that Carol asks her to choose her costume's new colour scheme, which doesn't even include the easy tribute of trying out Monica's own colour scheme, and Carol replaces it in Endgame anyway. Marvel's closest tribute was Carol adopting his colours and short hair from the comics in Endgame, but it ends up looking more like Justice Lord's Wonder Woman. Carol is placed front and centre, with Marvel playing a role in her backstory, unwittingly giving her powers, which might get retconned in a future film anyway if they incorporate Carol's new half Kree lineage from the comics. Carol's codename may be inspired by Marvel and serve as her tribute to her, but in the comics, it was a play on his own rank and name that came from the people he had chosen to defend. It was a sort of tribute to the people of his new home and served as a symbol of his new mission, and was then passed on to numerous others that used his name in homage of his heroism. In the film, it holds far less significance, and their willingness to change not only his sex, but his occupation and significance to Carol's story as well, and for very little reason at that, shows a lack of respect for the character on the part of the filmmakers. You could change her name to Cardan or something and you'd have an entirely new character. And this scaling back of Marvel will affect Kamala's Disney Plus show too. The Miz in Ms. Marvel was an easy way to differentiate Carol from Marvel. She was the female Marvel and the specific word indicated her feminism. But gender is the only thing it inherently distinguishes from the Captain. As such, Kamala using the Miz to differentiate herself from the Captain in a setting where there is not and never has been a male Captain Marvel genuinely makes no sense at all. Batgirl and Batwoman make age a distinction as well as gender to distinguish the female spin-offs from each other, so a setting that has Kate without Bruce could still introduce a Batgirl and have it make total sense. But Miz doesn't imply anything about her age, so it doesn't work. She's just the female counterpart to the already female Captain Marvel? And let's not even get into settings where Captain Marvel seemingly isn't around and might not even exist for all we know. And while Monica might get to be Carol's sidekick or successor in a future film, that seems really disrespectful to her. I saw some people back when the film came out call it racist to have the black character that predated this white woman's turn with the name now be a Carol fangirl. I don't know if I'd go that far, but it's definitely disrespectful to her place in the lineage. It's like if there was a Batman series that introduced Damian Wayne as the first Robin, with Dick Grayson later showing up as a kid who is inspired by Damian. Even more so seeing how Monica had no real ties to Carol before this, Carol even abandoned the Marvel name two months after Monica took over in 1982, which should tell you everything you need to know about that. But Monica is an important character in her own right, even removed from this legacy. She was the first African-American woman to join the Avengers, and even became the team's leader for a little over a year. A black woman leading the all-star hero team in the 1980s. You'd think Disney and Marvel would want to celebrate something like that, rather than a character whose best-known story was Avengers number 200. But no, they turned this much more historically significant hero into Kamala Khan without the powers. But honestly, you don't even need to watch the films to see how little regard Captain Marvel has for its own legacy. Just look at the theatrical posters for these characters' respective debuts. They have similar posing and positioning for the titular leads, but Carol stands alone while Scott is backed by both his predecessor and his future partner. Even fan favourite and box office boost Samuel L. Jackson doesn't get to grace Captain Marvel's poster, despite Nick Fury being the film's secondary protagonist. He had more screen time here than in The Winter Soldier, and that film had him on its poster. This is Carol's film, and she don't need no man to highlight how lacking in charisma she is. Couple this with trailers that are only spurred the title of cringiest superhero trailers of all time by the sledgehammer to the face that was Batwoman, and it's hard to see Captain Marvel as a film conceived by people with love and adoration for the source material, a la Ant-Man, rather than a cynically calculated move to get a female-led superhero movie out with no regard for how good said character actually is, nor the fact that, even before the comics did everything they could to make her utterly unlikable, Carol Danvers was probably on the lower end of interesting characters to hold the name. And this is coming from someone who was a big fan of hers in the mid-2000s. 
Even Endgame's poster made Carol larger than original Avengers Bruce Banner and Hawkeye, as well as Scott, who plays an integral role in the film's narrative, while Carol is relegated to only a handful of scenes at the start and end of the film. I don't care about box office gross for their films. The only gross I care about is how gross the treatment of Marvel and Monica was. So we go from a film that acknowledges and embraces the original character's role in the legacy by making him one of the central characters, and more important in that arc than even the actual lead character is, to a film that gleefully makes the original hero unrecognisable and relegates the more historically significant second bearer of the title to the role of fangirl for the seventh. So yeah, Ant-Man handled this subject a hell of a lot better than Captain Marvel did. And no, I didn't expect them to pay homage to the full legacy that preceded Carol. That would be impressive, but unrealistic. But the legacy and the characters that make up that legacy deserved better than this. Marvel should have been a proper mentor and a warrior, ideally still a young male too, who co-stars alongside her and whose teachings continue to push Carol forward even after he's gone. Again, like Vic and Renee. And Monica should have been Carol's Air Force partner so that she's on an even level with her source material successor, rather than being downgraded to Carol's starry-eyed spin-off character. If you liked this video, why not subscribe and support me on Patreon like these fine people here? If not, then make sure to share it with your enemies so they can suffer along with you. Today's recommended video is How Captain Marvel Changed the Scrolls by NerdSync. It's an interesting discussion of the context surrounding the race's creation and how the changing of the times may have affected their MCU portrayal. As such, Kamala using the Miz to differentiate herself... The Miz. <laughs> the Miz. 